The next question, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. How do we understand the varying number of rights of Muslims in different narrations? Again, a hadith related question. The essential answer here is that under one topic, you may find various narrations saying different things, even though it's talking about the same topic. So before we get into the rights of the Muslim, let's look at a different example. And that example would be, which deed is the most righteous deed? Which deed is the most righteous deed? Herein we find various narrations of the Prophet Muhammad In some narrations, the Prophet indicates clearly that the most righteous deed is jihad fi sabilillah, striving in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a righteous legitimate striving. In another narration, he would speak about the hajj and that a righteously performed hajj is the best deed. In a different narration, he would say that the best deed is that which is uh, which, which is small or consistent, even though it be small. So how do we reconcile between the fact that there are various narrations? They are all speaking about the same thing, like righteous deeds, yet they're saying different things. The basic answer of this is that each expression would have a different context and a different audience. And these different narrations cater to different contexts and audiences. And the same thing can be found in our uh, daily interactions as well. Somebody may come to me today and ask me a question about, for example, music in Islam. And then I give them a particular fatwa related to music in Islam. And my position there in, in this fatwa would be that of the majority of of. Uh, of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah and I tell them this is the fatwa and uh, they proceed. Then in a different gathering you have the same question coming forth and I present the answer still presenting the position of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah but then I also mention a minority view. So why would, would a scholar in one instance give one answer and in another instance give a slightly modified answer? It's the same answer essentially but he may add more detail. A very logical explanation is that in the one context, you are dealing with a, an audience of a particular maturity and a particular orientation. Perhaps they are, uh, perhaps they are extremely liberal in their approach to Islam and uh, they are young and they, they are looking for, you know, um, for justification of their vices. So a more strict approach would be taken. And then in a different context, you may find that the audience you are dealing with is a very conservative audience, um, not very tolerant of differences of opinion, not very tolerant of uh, different viewpoints. So therein you may give a more, uh, a more balanced uh, answer because you understand that by giving a very strict answer to this audience, it wouldn't be healthy for the application of Islam because it would feed into the ultra-conservative approach. So this is just in terms of the, the mufti, you know, giving a particular fatwa that is contextualized. The same thing essentially applies to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In some instances, he would say alayhi salatu wasallam that the best deed is to be righteous to your parents. Perhaps because the questioner was one who neglected the rights of his parents. In a different instance, the person may have been uh, somewhat of... Uh, you know, somewhat of an introvert and, and, and not very brave in his, in his approach in life. So the Prophet ﷺ may have encouraged that person, jihad fi sabilillah. In a different instance, the person may have lacked consistency in their efforts and the application of Islam is sporadic, in which case the Prophet ﷺ says to the person, um, it is to be consistent even though it be small. This is something we find throughout the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. There are various examples of this. For example, he would say, I've been sent only as one who perfects the standards of character. In another instance, he would say, I have been sent as a teacher. Now, there's no, there's no intrinsic contradiction in these statements, but rather there are contexts for these statements and they can be reconciled very easily. And the same thing applies to the rights of a Muslim. So, of course, there's, there's one narration that speaks about the rights of a Muslim over another Muslim are six, narrated by uh, the Sahih of Imam Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ would say in this hadith that 
the the six rights of a Muslim to another is that when you meet him, you give him the greetings of salam, that when he invites you, you respond to his invitation, when he seeks your advice, your nasiha, you provide him with advice, when he sneezes and praises Allah, that you supplicate for mercy for him, when he becomes ill, you visit him, and when he has a janaza, you pray upon uh, upon his janaza. So that's one context six rights of a Muslim over another Muslim, and there you have an answer. However, if you add to this, are these the only rights of a Muslim over another Muslim? Now, based on the fact that there are various other narrations that speak about other rights of Muslims over others, certainly we can say that no, these are not, these are not, uh, this is not an exhaustive list of the rights of a Muslim over another. Different contexts may have provided different answers to this uh, to this issue. Now there's a bigger lesson here. The bigger lesson is that it is essential for anyone looking to understand the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam to learn about his sunnah comprehensively as opposed to atomistically. Comprehensively meaning to take the entire corpus of Islam, the entire Quran, the entire sunnah the entire corpus of ijma and the entire corpus of the teachings of the Sahaba and understand all of that in general before reaching a conclusion upon any particular uh, teaching. And this applies not only in, in light of interpretation of hadith but everything. If you want to know whether it is sunnah to stand and drink or to sit and drink, you may open up a hadith book and the hadith book reads that the Prophet ﷺ stood and drank. And then based on that hadith, which is authentic, you may decide, well, then it is sunnah to stand and drink. But this is just one data point in a, in a plethora of other data points. The other data points would clearly indicate that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited standing and drinking. And he told somebody who stood and drank to spit out what they drank, right? to regurgitate what they drank. So if you, if you understand that these are various data points, then the next question is, so how do we reconcile this? Now, for the most part, the average Muslim wouldn't need to reconcile this. They would refer to the scholars who had already done the reconciliation for them. And the end result of that reconciliation is essentially the four schools of thought. So you go to the Shafi'i school and the Shafi'i school would tell you that it is sunnah to sit and drink. And the only reason why the Prophet ﷺ stood and drank in that one narration is to indicate that it is permissible to do so, albeit makru, disliked. Whereas the sunnah is, in general, to sit and drink, right? But had the Prophet ﷺ not stood and drank on that one occasion or two occasions, then the interpretation might have been different and we would have said, well, it is impermissible to stand and drink and it is obligatory to sit and drink. Because the law is derived from his life, alayhi salatu wasalam. And this is a much, a much bigger lesson than the question uh, at hand, which is essentially how do we understand the various narrations about the rights of Muslims. But it's a, it's a lesson that, that we all should learn as quickly as possible. That we cannot approach Islam atomistically, whether it be a verse of the Qur'an, whether that be a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, whether that be a particular practice. It is essential for consistency Right, for a coherent application of Islam's teachings, that we do so not atomistically but comprehensively. And the best solution for this would, of course, be to follow the traditional schools of thought in, um, in theology as well as in, in practice. And uh, beyond that, what is not, what is not um, you know, the focus point of theology and, and practice, there's going to be the, the practice of Islamic spirituality. So there again we refer to the scholars of Islamic spirituality. If you don't do that, you may end up with a lopsided, a wayward and a skewed um, you know, concept uh, or conceptualization of, of what Islamic spirituality is. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad,